Welcome to the recorded version of Making a Great Impression. Here is our agenda for the workshop. So we will be discussing the concept of professionalism and breaking down what it is. Um, so we have determined um, that professionalism um, involves these four pillars that you can see um, listed here. So professionalism is situational. Professionalism is responsibility, professionalism is behavior, and professionalism is competence. And we'll be going through um, the presentation, breaking these concepts or pillars down even more, um, and also providing you with examples uh, for you to think about um, that might very well um, come up in your new position. So by the end of this workshop, we hope that you'll be able to describe professionalism and how it is measured in the workplace, explain why professionalism is important, and be able to identify tangible ways that you can practice professionalism in the workplace. Lastly, um, and we'll get in this, into this in a couple of slides, um, we hope that this presentation, most importantly, will empower you to bring um, your entire uh, authentic self to your new opportunity um, and with that all of the identities all of the intersecting identities that make up your unique self um, in a way that you feel proud confident and um, authentic when you are starting your new opportunity so here we have our nace career readiness competencies um, NACE, if you aren't familiar, stands for the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Um, so college career centers and employers from the Fortune 500 and more um, are part of um, NACE. And um, as a professional association, they've come together to agree upon the set of competencies um, that they agree broadly prepare college graduates for a successful transition into the workplace. As you can see, professionalism is one of those, um, but it also overlaps with probably every single um, other competency that is listed on here. Um, so I think there is, you know, always a layer of professionalism um, that is inherent to each of these other competencies when you um, are in a workplace and um, in that situation. As we'll learn later, um, you know, professionalism is very reliant on the situation and the environment that you're in. Um, another part of professionalism is um, associated with your behavior um, and how you um, present yourself in certain situations or how you uh, react in certain situations. And then lastly, um, another piece is competence and, um, you know, being competent in teamwork, communication, um, equity and inclusion, technology, critical thinking, all of those things are really important as well um, in order to be a competent professional who can make that um, transition from um, education to uh, employment. So uh, first we wanted to present this um, question of what comes to mind when you think about professionalism. I think for me personally, um, growing up, I didn't really know what professionalism was. It was like this coded language that I didn't understand coming from a, an immigrant family um, and being the first in my family to go to college and be a professional. Um, it's still something that I feel I am trying to navigate. Um, so I think for me, when it comes, um, when I think of professionalism, I think more than anything, I think about what I've been told isn't professional. Um, and I feel like that wasn't helpful for me to really understand it as a concept um, and, you know, be able to present myself in a professional, quote unquote, manner. Um, so think, take some time to think about it. I don't know if my experience resonates with you or you have an entirely different thought. 
um, or experience when it comes to the idea of professionalism. Um, as I mentioned, we will break it down further, but um, I would like to ask you to think a little bit before you proceed um, with the rest of the recording. So before we dive into the four pillars of professionalism, we wanted to talk a little bit about bringing your whole self to work. So what does that mean? Uh, so bringing our whole selves to work means showing up authentically, leading with humility, and remembering that we're all vulnerable, uh, imperfect human beings doing the best that we all can. It's also about having the courage to take risks, speak up, ask for help, connect with others in a genuine way, and allow ourselves and others to be truly seen. It's not always easy for us to show up this way, especially at work. This may take time to develop, but we want to stress the importance of it as many of you go on to do great things in your career. Many of us fear making mistakes, looking bad, and being judged. We also worry about our jobs and financial security, which sometimes gives us justifiable reasons to withhold our true selves. This makes sense and maybe we have had negative experiences in the past that inform us in the present. Historically, we have seen the idea of professionalism suppress and in cases oppress many individuals and groups in the workplace and beyond. It takes courage, commitment, and bravery to be able to show up authentically and bring all of who we are to work. This presentation today is to encourage and empower you to prioritize yourself and others and the uniqueness that you all bring with each of your own ideas and your own innovation. So here on the slide, we have um, three different points. So the first is that of intersecting identities. So none of us is associated to just one identity. Um, if you look to the diagram on the right, you will see an adaptation of different parts of our identities and the primary, secondary, organizational, and cultural sectors. This is by no means exhaustive of all of the identities that exist. It is intended to represent that we all have multiple dimensions to our identities and many of them intersect. In the same way that you want your identities to be validated, it's important to validate others as well. When we validate others, we allow them to be safely themselves and share their feelings and thoughts. We are directly and indirectly letting them know that we respect their perception and ideas. Validation is listening, summarizing for clarification, and making space for others in conversations and spaces. The next point is saliency. So not all identities are salient. The strength of specific identities is fluid throughout life. Uh, in addition, some identities are visible and some aren't. Some will be part of your professional persona, but for others, certain identities will be subdued in the professional workspaces. Our identities are fluid and we feel them more or less during different times of our lives. And with saliency, I think that there is no right or wrong answer as to what um, you choose to be to present to others. I think that depends on your comfort. Um, and that, again, may change um, during different times of your life. Lastly, um, you aren't a token. So individuals are not responsible for representing an entire group that shares a particular identity. So don't feel like you're required to take on the fight on behalf of your identity. So now that we've talked a bit about bringing your whole self to work, uh, we'll start going into the different pillars of what makes up professionalism. Um, so our first pillar that we'll talk about is professionalism is situational. So what is considered professionalism often depends on the situation and your specific job or internship site. So it's important when you are starting a new opportunity to take time to ask some of those clarifying questions. 
So um, with regard to dress code, so what is the dress code specifically? Um, in some environments, you know, for example, tech companies, it's okay to dress down um, most days, whereas other environments, um, maybe you have to dress more um, business casual as opposed to casual. And then on Fridays, um, there might be the option to dress more casually. Um, the next piece is boundaries. So are there defined office hours? So um, again, another example, um, because I work with engineering students, um, one thing I hear often um, from professionals is, um, well, I've heard from some professionals, um, is that they're, um, as long as they get their work done, especially now that um, many people are, um, you know, able to work remotely, maybe part of the time, um, as long as they get their work done, um, it doesn't necessarily matter like what times they work, um, as long as they are meeting that expectation. Um, but that might not be the case, for example, um, at the Career Center, we have to be, um, you know, our regular office hours are from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So it's not necessarily possible for us to work, you know, into the late hours of the night um, because we have a set expectation to be open to students during this um, period of time. Another thing to consider is um, if you are working in a physical location, um, you know, policies regarding, um, you know, shared spaces, um, having your door open, um, if you can keep your doors closed, what does that mean or what does that communicate? Um, again, at our center, usually if we have our office doors closed, it's because we are meeting with a student um, and for privacy reasons, we have that um, space closed or because we are maybe on a call or working on something really important. Um, next, we have communication. So what are the expectations? Um, what are the preferred methods? What software are you using if you're working uh, remotely um, some or all of the time. Uh, for Zoom calls, it may be, you know, having your video on all the time. Um, I think one of the rewards for, I think, um, winning some um, team break activity or a game that we did was um, that we could have our video off during the next team um, or all staff meeting that we had. Um, so it's important to clarify all of these things because it's not going to be a one size fits all across the board in every single workplace. Each workplace has its own needs um, for, you know, um, their employees, but also maybe to clients um, or visitors, guests, things like that. So it's important to clarify rather than to assume. So with specific regard to dress code, um, again, a lot of it is going to depend on um, the environment that you're working in. Um, and that will probably tell you whether you have to dress um, casually or business casual. But in addition to that, um, other things to consider are if you work in a lab or field setting, it's important to uh, follow safety recommendations and policies um, so that you are not harmed in any way um, if there is, you know, an issue or an accident that occurs. Other things to consider is um, focusing on clothes that fit you well, no matter what your style um, or, um, you know, what um, pieces you choose. And I think probably most importantly is comfort. Um, so discomfort can be distracting for yourself and potentially others as well um, if you don't feel comfortable in your clothes. So um, I think most importantly is to find things that make you feel your best um, so that you can do your best work as well. Um, if you are wearing something, you know, shoes that are too small or something that maybe you feel self-conscious in, it's going to be something that takes up a lot of your energy in terms of like your thoughts. Um, and you may be distracted. Um, it might result in making, you know, more careless mistakes. 
um, or, you know, being fully present in um, your work and what you're supposed to be working on. So um, these are kind of um, when it comes to um, dress code, um, unless, you know, obvious aside from the things that are um, very clear in terms of like um, policies at your work uh, regarding casual business, casual safety and things like that, focusing on things that fit you well, um, that you're comfortable in and you feel confident in. Now we're at our first case study, which is Mia is a creative writing major at UCR and is in their second week as a social media intern with the County of Orange. Last week, Mia's supervisor shared that today they would be in and out of meetings. However, Mia has a question about a task they are working on. At noon, Mia notices that their supervisor is in their office alone. How should Mia approach the situation? So pause the video here, take some time to think about it and um, come up with one or two ways um, that you think Mia should approach the situation before you proceed with the recording. So hopefully by now you have given this um, case study some thought, um, some possible um, approaches to the situation. I think ideally, um, the best approach would be to, um, you know, when um, Mia's supervisor shared um, that they would be in and out of meetings the week before, um, it would have been um, a good time to ask um, and clarify um, what Mia should do if um, they have a question um, or, you know, who they should reach out to um, instead of their supervisor. Another thing to clarify um, is, you know, that open door policy. What does that mean? Um, if they are sitting in their office alone, does that mean, you know, it's okay to um, go um, see the supervisor um, and ask them a question? Um, or what is that boundary that um, is in place? Um, however, if that clarification didn't occur, which in this case um, hasn't, um, some other approaches are um, to possibly ask someone else, um, if it at all possible. Um, but Mia could also um, go to the supervisor, um, maybe knock on the, um, the frame of the door or the cubicle, whatever it is, um, and ask them if it's a good time to talk um, because they have a question about the task they're working on. Um, and if it isn't, um, then um, maybe let the supervisor know they have a question. So to um, come talk to them when they have a moment or um, ask, you know, if there's someone else that they can ask um, or speak to, that would also be um, a good source of information. So those are just some possible um, approaches. Um, maybe you thought of others. Um, if you are interested in learning more about um, you know, this situation or similar situations, um, feel free to ask us at the Career Center. Our second pillar is professionalism is responsibility. This pillar of responsibility is really about you building credibility as a professional and um, as a responsible professional. So um, it kind of goes in line with the quote that we have here, um, or saying, I should say, um, you are what you do, not what you say you'll do. So how can you go about, you know, building this credibility? So uh, one of the things you can do is um, being realistic about timelines. So whenever you are working on a task or a project, avoid over promising on how quickly you can complete this task or project. Um, if you find yourself needing more time, it's OK to ask. Um, and it would actually be better to ask than to you know, um, provide a um, an unfinished project because maybe you over um, or underestimated actually how much time it would take to complete um, another, um, you know, 
a not ideal <laughs> situation would be um, completing the task or project, but maybe it's not at the quality that was expected in order to meet this um, timeline that wasn't realistic in the first place. The uh, another um, component is following through on responsibilities. So um, if you say that you'll take something on, commit to completing it. Um, so this is really in line with that you are what you do, not what you say you'll do. So if you say you're going to do something, do it and complete it. Um, and give yourself time um, to learn your new role before taking on extra projects. It's very easy to fall into the um, habit of saying yes to a lot of things, um, but it's better to get to know your role, um, the expectations that comes with it, clarifying um, things that you need clarified, um, and really um, immersing yourself in the role before you take on um, extra projects that might take away time from that. So when you need support, um, please ask for it. You don't have to know everything right away um, or ever really. Um, most of the time, in most roles, you are going to be working as part of a team. Um, and it's important to know when to ask people for help and know um, who to ask for for different things. So your team is going to have their own um, unique set of strengths and each team member is going to contribute to that. So um, one thing that we do at the um, Career Center, and it kind of goes through with like giving yourself time to learn your new role, um, if this isn't already built into your onboarding or your training, um, ask if you can do like informational interviews or informal meet and greets um, with the people um, that you'll be working with, especially those that you'll be working with very closely so that you can learn more about their roles, um, their strengths um, and their areas of expertise. So. Um, if you need help in the future, you know who to ask for for certain things. Another thing um, that's important to do is um, always ask clarifying questions, um, but seek input from these colleagues or team members if you need to. So um, that's why it can be really important to understand what everyone does, um, what their role is, and what their strengths are. And lastly, we have um, the usage of sick, vacation, personal time. So be mindful of um, the work cycle. Um, so if it is normal to be really busy during a specific time of the year, um, be mindful of not scheduling a significant time off um, unless you know it's something completely unavoidable, of course. Um, and be mindful of who will cover for you as well on sick time. Um, before um, you use or before you have need of using um, sick vacation or personal time, um, determine the notification preferences um, when asking and or notifying other staff. So again, it kind of goes back to um, professionalism is situational and um, clarifying expectations beforehand. So uh, determine what everyone's preferred method of communication or notifying, um, you know, when you will be out of office. Um. Another way to build your credibility um, as being a responsible individual is how you brand yourself in email communications. So here we have a sample email um, and we're going to kind of go through each of the different components. Um, we actually recommend that you have the uh, recipient email address in the to section. Include that last just in case, you know, sometimes things happen and the email gets sent um, before it's completed. So that's why we recommend um, that you um, include that last. Um, next would be including the clear subject line. Again, this might be helpful to include towards the end. Um, sometimes it can be hard to think of something that is short, um, succinct, and clear. So um, I would, depending on what it is that um, I am 
emailing about, if it's really easy for me to kind of just come up with a clear subject line, I will do that first. If I'm kind of unsure, you know, there's a lot of things um, that need to be addressed, then I will kind of work on the body of the email first. Always greet the person that you are addressing. So here we have Dear Taylor. Um, you can also say hi, hello, good afternoon, good morning, so and so. Um, if you are going to use, um, you know, prefixes like Mr. or Miss, Mrs., um, be sure you are using the right ones. Um, if you are unsure um, and you want to still show like that respect, um, you can use MX, which is a um, gender neutral um, prefix if you would like to do so. Um, so then we have the actual body of the email. When you're writing um, the body of the email, make sure that you're communicating very clearly what the purpose of you reaching out is. So here we have, thank you for meeting with me yesterday. I wanted to see if you were available sometime this week to discuss plans on how we plan to get to the marketing meeting. My car is getting serviced and I want to discuss other transportation options in case my car isn't ready. I am available tomorrow at 12 p.m., but let me know what time works for you this week. Feel free to email or call me at this number. Thank you. Sincerely, Courtney. So again, it is very clear and to the point. Um, other things I really like about this um, email is the fact that the um, individual, Courtney, mentioned that, uh, you know, what their availability is, but they are being considerate of um, Taylor to, um, you know, provide their availability so they can kind of uh, work with their schedule as well. Um, and because of the purpose of this email, the subject line, transportation to marketing meeting is um, a really good way to um, communicate what is the topic of this email um, in a succinct way. And lastly, we have um, the signature at the bottom. So we have Courtney Highlander, student assistant, student athletics department, treasurer, student organization, class of 2018 student at University of California, Riverside with the phone and email um, contact info. So if you don't have um, a, any um, positions on campus or you're not a member of a student org, that's okay. You can include um, class of, um, you know, whatever graduating class you intend to graduate, um, student at University of California, Riverside. You can also include, um, you know, what department that you're in as well. Um, if you are a research assistant um, in one of the research labs on campus, you can include that. Um, but very minimally, do include um, UCR, what class you intend to graduate, and your contact information. Other things to be mindful of um, are your response time, um, the formality of your message, because that can communicate um, a sign of respect to others, and how you are using um, CC, BCC, and reply all functions with email. In addition to email, uh, branding yourself as credible and a responsible professional can be done through meetings as well. And so when you are attending a meeting, it's really important to be able to prepare ahead of time if you're able to. So if you have the agenda prior to the meeting, um, review it so that you can know what it is that you're being asked to share or discuss in that meeting. Be sure to arrive on time or slightly before to avoid falling behind schedule and avoid going longer than the um, indicated meeting time. Um, this is also, um, you know, in order to be mindful and considerate of the time of others who are attending that meeting who may have other tasks and projects that they're working on or perhaps other meetings that they're attending after the one that they're um, meeting with you. Afterwards, um, be sure to follow up if there are any action items or timelines um, that need to be addressed and stick to these as well as you can. 
if you make any mistakes or if you are late or miss a deadline, uh, remember that no one is perfect. Um, so it's best to acknowledge the error and um, focus on doing better next time. This brings us to our next case study. So James is a mechanical engineering major at UCR and just started their internship with Northrop Grumman in the space systems group. James has a class assignment that is due tomorrow and James noticed that they have an hour of free time within their shift. Should James work on their class assignment during internship hours or utilize this free time to connect with a colleague in a role that James is interested in pursuing post-grad? Why? So I'd like to ask you to pause here and think about um, this case study and what you think that James should do. So hopefully by now you've given this um, scenario some thought. Um, I would highly recommend that James uses this time to connect with a colleague in a role that James is interested in pursuing post-grad. Um, this is really valuable time that they might not be able to get back. Perhaps, you know, things kind of pick up in the internship afterwards. Um, so the beginning of an internship, which is where James is currently at, is a really great way to get to know the other people in the company, um, do meet and greets, informational interviews, kind of understand what everyone um, is an expert in or what is their um, specialization so that they can understand, you know, who can I go to for help with this um, and things like that. So this is a really good opportunity to take advantage of that may not come up in the future. Um, this is also a way to communicate, um, for James to communicate their interests and kind of brand themselves as someone who is uh, responsible um, and has a, a genuine interest in this company, its employees, and this field. The next pillar of what makes up professionalism is behavior. So on the job, um, most of the time when it comes to verbal communication, um, it's often not what you say, but how you say it that can really communicate your feelings and attitudes. So um, as you can see on this slide, 7% of the message that you're conveying um, is communicated by the words that you're speaking. 38% um, can be um, gathered from the tone of voice that you use, and 55% is from body language. So your behavior and um, how you present yourself um, with your nonverbal um, communication can be um, a way that you can um, express, you know, your uh, respect and consideration for others. So when you are in a meeting. Um, be sure that you put away any distractions, so cell phone, food, avoid engaging in side conversations um, once the meeting has progressed, and um, balance your contributions. So ask questions, provide input, and leave space for others to do the same as well. And if you notice a colleague or yourself is frequently spoken over, um, be sure to redirect the conversation back. So it's really important in um, on the job and in meetings um, that everyone is working together and everyone's input is being taken into consideration. Um, so it's important for you to not only um, communicate your thoughts, uh, but also give that space to others as well. So beyond the typical eight or nine to five, um, you may also be invited and asked to attend um, social events through work. Um, and also when it concerns um, digital and social media, um, it's important to be mindful of your behaviors in these different spaces too. Um, so at social events, being mindful of um, you know, alcohol consumption, 
um, the disclosure of information um, that you would not normally do in um, the workplace and also utilizing um, the space to discuss work when it isn't appropriate as well. Sometimes when we have like team building activities or team breaks, um, there might be, you know, the um, constraint or um, guideline or rule um, that this is, you know, kind of a space for everyone to recharge, not necessarily talk about work. So be mindful of those things, depending on uh, what the purpose of the event is. Also, be mindful of your social media privacy settings, who you're connected to and what you're sharing on your social media. So use your social media platforms wisely and differently. So don't feel like you need to open them all up um, to your colleagues. Um, maybe, you know, for um, professional life and for your work, um, you primarily use LinkedIn and maybe you choose to keep the other platforms um, privately and you don't open that up to your colleagues, that's fine. Um, if you do choose to open that up, be mindful of what you are sharing um, and who you're connected to as well. And um, be sure that those things are respectful and um, keep that in mind when you are interacting with people from other, uh, who represent other identities and backgrounds. So this brings me to the next point of being inclusive. Um, so these types of events tend to show how you engage with others naturally in conversation. Um, so be mindful um, and avoid being clicky. Find ways to intentionally include others and get to know the people that you work with. For this pillar, we have two case studies. Um, this is the first one. So Richard is a liberal arts major at UCR and is in their second year of college. Richard just started a teaching assistantship with John W. North High School and they are working with seniors. Richard notices that one of the students in the class requested to follow them on Instagram and sent a direct message. How should Richard respond? So if you could take a few moments to think about this scenario um, and then unpause to um, kind of hear about my thoughts um, and recommendations. So when working um, with minors, um, it is probably best if you are using like a personal account um, to not um, allow other um, the students that you're working with in this case um, to be able to follow you and to communicate with them using that channel. Um, when I was working in K through 12 settings, um, I had a very strict rule of not um, following or allowing my students to follow me. I had everything privated um, just to kind of keep those boundaries really more than anything. Um, and so I would advise in this situation to do the same. Um, I, when I was a student or when I worked with um, other professionals in K through 12, um, some people had different um, follow different rules. So they might have, you know, told students um, that they work with that when you graduate, you are welcome to request to follow me or request to add me on these different social media platforms. Um, so that could be another option. Um, another option would be to maybe create a profile where you communicate with your students. So maybe um, for this one, um, Richard is a teaching assistant, um, so maybe they have a social media page that they use specifically to communicate information related to um, the course or courses that they help with um, at this high school and nothing else beyond that. So kind of keeping it um, professional and related to the role. So those would be my suggestions for this um, particular role uh, or this particular case study. Our next case study is Natalie, a biology major at UCR, is doing research in a lab on campus. 
they need to send an email to a grad student in the lab to set a meeting date to go over their research results. Please critique the draft of their following email. Hi, we need to meet regarding a research results. When are you free? My schedule is super packed and I'm wondering if you can work around my schedule. Please let me know what days work for you and I will confirm. Natalie. So take a few moments to think about this um, email draft and um, what, it, what you think about it and any um, feedback or suggestions that you have. All right, so hopefully by now you have given um, this email draft some more thought. So um, from my end, what I'm seeing is, first of all, um, I would recommend greeting the person. I know in the actual case study, we don't have a name for the grad student, um, but I would recommend doing that. I would also um, maybe start the email with saying like, I hope your day is going well, or um, you know, if they had a previous connection and they talked about maybe plans um, that the grad student had, kind of like weaving that in. So a little bit more of like the relationship building piece um, rather than just kind of like jumping right into the um, what is being asked here. Um, and I think um, also kind of using um, gentler language, it seems very um, like in your face kind of, like we need to meet regarding a research result maybe um, I would like to schedule a time to meet um, to discuss research results. Um, and also, I think I mentioned this in a previous example for the email draft. Um, one thing I really liked about the first email draft that we were reviewing is the fact that the student um, was mentioning kind of their availability, but also was very considerate of the other person's schedule too. So um, this email right here where it says my schedule is super packed and I'm wondering if you can work around my schedule um, is a little bit, um, yeah, it's not taking into consideration much um, the graduate student schedule, which is probably also really busy too. So um, I think being clearer with um, the students um, availability, especially if it is super packed. I think it would be helpful to say I'm free at this time, um, but I was wondering if this works for you or I also wanted to be mindful of your schedule. Please let me know uh, what works for you um, so that we can schedule something as soon as possible. And then I would also probably sign it with like sincerely or best regards, warm regards, something. Um, and also it's not mandatory, but um, especially if it's someone that you email with frequently, um, it's might not be um, the most normal thing to include your signature with someone that you email back and forth often, um, but that is another thing. Um, and if this is like the first um, email or one of very few emails that Natalie is sending to the graduate student, I think having the email signature would be helpful in that case. So now we are at our last pillar, which is professionalism is competence, which is really all about doing your best work and bringing your best self to your role and your workplace. So you can do this by um, one, being reliable. So not just always relying on your team members, but also um, you know lending that support as well. So it's, um, it is important to receive help when it is needed from others, but also give that back to, to your team. Um, seek professional development opportunities. So most employers, if not all of them, um, will offer opportunities for you to be able to grow professionally um, and do your role even better than you um, are currently doing, or if um, you know there's opportunities uh, for advancement and things like that. Um, sometimes, you know, there might not be conferences or opportunities that may not necessarily be on their radar. So if there is something um, that doesn't seem to be on the table per se, um, you know, and you think that it would have a lot of value and you're interested in attending it, 
you can always, you know, um, communicate these things to your supervisors, um, communicate why it's important to your work and see if it would be a potential opportunity for you to attend and further your um, professional and career development. And lastly is clarifying expectations. Um, this is, I mean, we've been talking about this the, um, for a lot of the um, presentation, um, but it is really important, especially when you start a new role or a new project, um, to clarify those expectations, um, because that is really going to help not only you, but the, the project that you're working on. Um, it's going to help you in all of the different components and um, subsets of your role and enable you to showcase your strengths effectively uh, by keeping everyone on the same page. So now we're at our last case study, which is Janae is a business major with a concentration in accounting at UCR and is interning at Google in the finance department over summer 2021. They are brainstorming a budget proposal for a new project and the turnaround for submission of this project is two weeks. They're currently feeling a bit overwhelmed because they do not feel like they know exactly what their role is in presenting this proposal, which they do. So take a few moments, pause this video and um, think about what should be done in this case. So hopefully by now you were able to give this um, scenario some thought. So I think really with this um, case, because um, the student intern is feeling overwhelmed, it seems like they're a little bit stuck or unclear with what their role is in um, you know, creating and presenting this proposal. I think the crucial first step to ensure that the rest of the project run smoothly and has um, a chance of being successful is for um, Janae to reach out to their supervisor and to clarify the expectations of their role in this project. If you're still seeking your next opportunity or want to plan ahead and um, look for opportunities after you complete your current one, uh, you, one way to do so is by joining the UCR Career Network, which is an online community for networking, mentoring, and job opportunities uh, for not only current students, but alumni as well. It's a great way to connect with other Highlanders, whether they're current students or former students. Um, and you might be able to talk about, um, you know, talk to these individuals about, you know, the concept of professionalism and the different pillars that we talked about today and get more insight from them as um, more seasoned professionals. So you can do so by registering at careernetwork.ucr.edu. I hope that this presentation was helpful in demystifying the concept of professionalism and breaking it down into these different pillars um, that you can then take and apply into your next opportunity. If you have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, on the next slide, we will have our contact information and hours of operation.